Hello. So welcome to this series of lessons on Baron Cohen's study that was done in 2001. The purpose of this study was to use the revised eyes test to determine how effective the test was when used with people who have high functioning autism or something called Asperger's syndrome, when they are trying to determine somebody else's mental state, which is also called our ability to, or our theory of mind. So in this particular lesson, I'll give you a broad overview of that study and talk about the key terms, and then we'll move on to the more detailed lessons. So this study is part of the cognitive approach. And if you recall, there are two main assumptions of the cognitive approach. The first is that our brain is a supercomputer and it receives information from the external environment, which is called input, and then processes that information um, and then produces our behavior or our thoughts or our feelings. Um, and those responses are referred to as the outputs. And the other key assumption is that all of our behavior and our experiences, our feelings, <clears throat> our cognitions, of course, our thoughts, um, can all be understood if we simply understand cognitive processes and remember that the cognitive processes are always going to be thinking, learning, remembering, <clears throat> processing information from the environment, sensory information, perception, making sense of what you see around you. And all of those processes, if you can understand the way that they work inside your brain, you will be able to understand everything there is to know about how and why people are different sometimes, individual differences in behavior and thought and feeling exist. Um, and so this particular study was, Baron Cohen uh, was the lead author of the study, and he is somebody who's done extensive amounts of work on autism in particular. And in this study, he used a test called the ICE test, but he used a revised version of the ICE test because he had originally used this ICE test back in um, the 90s, and uh, there were some issues in the findings, and he wanted to make sure that the test was more effective in determining how uh, people with autism are able to to understand social cues because there are differences in that ability. And so he wanted to figure out how the revised ICE test can be used effectively in that context. And to do so, he conducted a laboratory experiment. And that laboratory experiment was accompanied with a correlation. So you'll remember that an experiment or an experimental study tries to determine some sort of cause and effect relationship. Um, and over here, there was the cause and effect relationship was quite simple. It was about which group of participants um, would create, would result, would provide what kind of results on the ICE test scores. And the correlation part of this was about the relationship between the AQ, which is a specific assessment. Um, it's called the, I'll write it here. It's called the autism quotient test. And the point of this test is to determine the, or to measure the extent to which a particular person has traits that are associated with this condition of autism. Before I tell you about the ICE test itself, uh, just a very quick uh, definition of autism, and you'll learn about what it is in detail in later lessons, but autism is uh, a developmental disorder, and it usually sets in, or the onset of autism is usually in the early years of life. And it is characterized by very repetitive, inflexible sort of patterns, adherence to routine, um, as well as social deficits, which are basically difficulties in understanding and responding to verbal and nonverbal cues. Um, and so these are some of the main characteristics of autism. Um, so the autism quotient test was meant to measure specific traits uh, because that was an important piece of the study, considering the focus of the study was on how people who have autism will be able to, or how well people who have autism are able to detect other people's mental states and identify those mental states. And that is called the theory of mind. Anyway, so the eyes test itself, as you can see right here, um, it did include images of different types of eyes. 
that were given um, to the participants of the experiment. And then they were asked to identify the mental states that they thought those eyes reflected based on a long list of descriptive words. And you learn more about the procedure in detail. However, for now, just remember that this was an experiment that also wanted to figure out if there was a relationship. There's a correlation, is a relationship between the autism quotient uh, test and the eyes test or the revised eyes test. Because remember that the first version of the eyes test was already used by Baron Cohen back in the 90s. And so in 2001, he wanted to improve the test. And that was one of the purposes of this experiment as well. Now, um, over 200 people participated in this experiment. And they were divided into these numbered groups. These numbers are important for you to remember because each number is used repeatedly as we move through different lessons. And you will need to also remember this for your exam. But group one comprised of people who had autism. And they had established diagnoses of high functioning autism or Asperger syndrome. Asperger syndrome used to be something that was classified as a separate syndrome in which autistic traits were visible. However, now, uh, 20 plus years later, Asperger is uh, associated as part of the autism spectrum and is no longer a separate syndrome. And then group two comprised of what we call neurotypical adults, which is essentially people without any sort of autism syndrome disorder or condition. And then you also had these neurotypical undergraduate students with very high IQ. These were students enrolled at the University of Cambridge. And if you've heard of the University of Cambridge UK, you know that it admits only exceptionally bright students and so the assumption for group three is that all of the participants in group three had very high iq and then you had group four which was 14 people who were matched on the basis of their iq and their age to all the participants in group one who were people who did have autism but the participants in group four did not have autism however they were similar in their iq level and their age to the 15 participants in group one. So like I mentioned, this experiment used a revised version of the original eyes test and all of these participants took this revised version of the eyes test and the results of the eyes test plus the results of the autism quotient were used to establish a correlation. Do keep in mind though that group two did not take the autism quotient test. And you'll learn why this was the case as we move through our lessons. So now let's look at the key terms as we proceed in our series of lessons. You'll be able to keep those in mind. So theory of mind, as I mentioned, is our ability to attribute or determine mental states to oneself or another person. It's basically mind reading almost when you are able to take the perspective of someone else's and by taking someone else's perspective into account, we are able to make sense of their behavior or even to predict what they'll do next. It's called mentalizing sometimes. And you can think about it as overlapping with empathy because empathy is about being able to step into someone else's frame of reference. So theory of mind is related to empathy, but do not think please that it is the same thing. It is not, there's simply an overlap, right? So, Theory of mind or perspective taking or how we attribute mental states that other people have or determine what the mental state of another person is, is theory of mind. Um, then you have social cognition. So remember that cognition is our thinking, our problem solving, our perception, our memory, and so on. Our social cognition is all of those thought processes, but the ones that are involved in our social interaction. So it's how we will, um, how we interpret social cues. So for instance, if you see somebody and they frown at you, then they are offering you a non-verbal social cue to tell you that perhaps they think that the way you are behaving is not appropriate. Um, and so you would modify your behavior. So we really as human beings rely heavily on social cues because remember it's true, man is a social animal. And we learn through what we see in our environment. So social cognition is a cognitive psychology perspective as well on how we 
are able to perceive and make sense of the social world around us. Then you have autism spectrum disorder. Now, as I mentioned, this is a developmental disorder. Key characteristics here are deficits in social cognition. So you can visibly spot someone who has autism by paying close attention to their social interaction. Some people who have autism spectrum disorder have learned how to be in social situations and have been exposed to the kind of nurturing and support that helps them be more functional socially. And you will not maybe be able to spot their challenges in communication. But for other people who have not had access to that kind of support, you can tell that uh, uh, there is a presence of autism spectrum disorder. Then Asperger's syndrome uh, is, like I mentioned, it's no longer used. So it's an outdated term. However, at the time the study was published, it did exist in the diagnostic manual as a condition on its own. Um, and now it's been included as part of autism spectrum disorder because uh, the psychologists realized that it was difficult to differentiate it reliably from autism spectrum disorder because the symptoms between the two were very overlapping. Now, next you should know that the intelligence quotient or the IQ I just talked about is a psychometric test-based measure of human intelligence. I'm sure you've all taken an IQ test online at some point. Um, I would like to tell you that do remember IQ is not exactly fixed um, and also don't rely on just IQ tests uh, to determine your IQ. Uh, and then you have the autism spectrum quotient that I just talked about, which is a self-report questionnaire. And it's supposed to measure for any adult, not just people who you think have high functioning autism or, or on the spectrum, but it can be used with any adult to determine the extent to which you or me have some level of autistic traits. And then lastly, you have the correlation that I mentioned. A correlation is not a causal relationship, but it is something in research where we are looking at what the relationship is between two variables. So if X changes, then how does Y change? And in when we talk about correlations, you should also remember we have positive correlations and we have negative correlations. Positive correlations are when X increases, Y also increases, so the change is upward, it's positive. Negative correlations are when X decreases, Y increases, or when X increases, y reduces so there's an inverse change in y when we're talking about a negative correlation this is an important one for you to remember because it's specially relevant to this study and you'll find out why when you get to the results part of our lessons 